Hi, chào mừng các bạn đã quay trở lại với kênh của mình. Mình tên là Duy, chủ của kênh Vật lý Chill. Vật lý Chill là kênh chuyên cung cấp cho các bạn nhiều kiến thức bổ ích về toán học, vật lý cũng như thực hiện các clip phỏng vấn chất lượng với những nhân tài đến từ khắp nơi trên thế giới. Video lần này sẽ là tập 5 trong series phỏng vấn các thí sinh Mỹ tham dự Olympic Vật lý Quốc tế hay còn được gọi là IFO. Nếu bạn chỉ mới biết đến kênh thì mình khuyên các bạn nên xem lại tập 1 của series này để hiểu rõ hơn về IFO nhé. Khách mời lần này của chúng ta là một người vô cùng đặc biệt với một profile siêu đỉnh, đó chính là anh Eric Schneider, người từng đạt huy chương vàng IFO năm 2012 được tổ chức tại Estonia. Anh tốt nghiệp ngành toán từ trường đại học danh giá Princeton vào năm 2017 và hiện đang làm cho công ty quản lý đầu tư tên là Change Street. Điểm qua về mặt thành tích của anh vào năm cấp 3 thì nó thật sự làm cho đội ngũ edit video cảm thấy rất là hoang mang luôn. Oh my God. Ngoài việc giành được huy chương vàng IFO ra, Eric còn thật sự là một Math League rất là năng nổ. Math League là một thuật ngữ dành cho những bạn tham gia rất nhiều kỳ thi toán học ở mọi cấp độ và độ tuổi. Anh từng tham dự học sinh giỏi toán quốc gia 5 lần, với 3 lần giành huy chương vàng từ năm 2010 đến năm 2012. Cũng trong 3 năm này, anh được mời tham gia MOP, một trại hè toán học cực kỳ danh giá. Đây cũng là nơi đã huấn luyện cũng như chọn ra đội tuyển đại diện cho nước Mỹ tham dự Olympic Toán Quốc tế hay IMO. Mình cũng đã làm một video về chủ đề MOP và IMO Mỹ rồi Cho nên bạn nào muốn biết rõ hơn thì hãy xem lại nhé Tiếp đó, anh cũng tham gia và giành nhiều giải thưởng toán lớn nhỏ khác Xuyên suốt từ cấp 1 cho đến cấp 3 Chưa dừng lại ở đây, Eric còn lấn sang các kỳ thi khoa học khác Như tham gia học sinh giỏi tinh quốc gia, học sinh giỏi háo quốc gia, học sinh giỏi sinh quốc gia Và học sinh giỏi tiếng Latin quốc gia với một huy chân vàng Đó là về mảng học thuật Anh cũng rất là năng nổ trong các bộ môn thể chất như đạt đai đen môn taekwondo, tham gia và giành nhiều giải thưởng lớn nhỏ khác ở trong các bộ môn như tennis, bóng đá, bóng quần, đấu kiếm và ném đĩa. Wow, mình không biết là cái ông này là người ngoài hành tinh hay là người trái đất, mà cái môn nào ông cũng cân được hết, quả là một con người giỏi toàn diện. Đó là câu chuyện ở cấp 3, nhưng khi lên đại học, anh cũng rất là tích cực, chinh chiến tại nhiều kỳ thi danh giá khác. Anh có hai lần đại diện cho Princeton tham dự ICPC World Final. Đây là một kỳ thi lập trình quốc tế lâu đời và rất nổi tiếng ở trong giới sinh viên IT. Hàng năm, các trường đại học top trên toàn thế giới sẽ cử một đội tranh tài tại ICPC để giải quyết các vấn đề lập trình cực kỳ hốc búa. Bên cạnh đó, Eric cũng từng lọt vào top 20 ở trong kỳ thi Bút Nam. Bút Nam là một kỳ thi toán học thường niên dành cho các sinh viên đại học hoặc cao học ở Mỹ và Canada, không phân biệt quốc tịch của họ. Kỳ thi này khó hơn rất rất nhiều so với IMO, cho nên nếu bạn lọt vào top 5 người có số điểm cao nhất, bạn sẽ được Đại học Harvard cung cấp học bổng để theo đuổi cao học. Một profile rất là khủng khiếp đúng không nào? Vậy thì ngay bây giờ đây, chúng ta sẽ được nghe Eric chia sẻ chi tiết về lộ trình học tập của mình, cũng như nguồn động lực để thôi thúc anh học tập và rèn luyện để được như ngày hôm nay. Người tham gia cùng mình trong buổi phỏng vấn này đó chính là anh Ryan Đặng, cụ sinh viên trường UCLA một trong những ngôi trường đại học thuộc tóc đầu ở trên thế giới. Ok, có lẽ nhiều đó cũng đã đủ kích thích sự tò mò của các bạn rồi. Vì thế, chúng ta hãy cùng nhau bước vào buổi phỏng vấn thôi nào. Hey Eric, how's it going? It's going well. Uh, it's a good weekend. I can't complain. Uh, just a quick introduction. Yes, my name is Dui. I am the representative of the Vietnamese physics community. And my job is like, you know, to reach out contestants from around the world to learn a new way of learning for physics, as well as like hearing some inspiring story that encourage the student to pursue physics and advance STEM in general. Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, I just recently graduated from UCLA and I'm just applying to medical school and I'm doing this for fun because uh, he, he reached out to me and uh, it seemed like you interviewing the smartest people in the world. So <laughs> might as well. And it's been a great experience so far. This is going to be my second interview with uh, Dewey. And yes, uh, let's start with the first question. Um, so we were just kind of wondering when you really got your interest in physics, like when you found it, if you remember a certain point in time when you did. So I, I always loved problem solving, always trying to figure things out and understanding how the, all the pieces fit together. Um, so I remember I, used, I did competitions from when I was back in early middle school and I was always very advanced in school, always wanting to learn more and understand more. Um, and when I actually started learning physics, well, I started doing math, like calculus and stuff back in 
go to school. And then when I started trying to learn dynamics and then I remember in ninth grade, I start, I heard about F equals MA um, and all the physics competition stuff. I'm like, oh, I, that was the name of the intro, uh, US competition. Uh, so I'm like, oh, I could do well at that. I understand things. Uh, so that's when I really started looking into it and looking into all the different books and Feynman and starting researching and trying to do, figure out how do I do well in this environment. Uh, wow, I see. So you, you, you basically just like went into the realm of physics all your life from middle school to like, you've always enjoyed the subject. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I always like understanding how the world works and trying to like, when I see a problem, trying to break it down to its individual pieces and then put them back together and try to figure out what matters and how can I figure that out. Um, and I'm a very visual person. So like I try to visualize the problems and see how does wow. this relate or how do I get this uh, into my math map and what, what's actually important and what's going on. Uh, so uh, I, I, I always enjoyed physics. I always enjoyed math. I always enjoyed trying to figure out how to understand things. Back then, like during your high school, do you join any like, you know, some science program that prepare you for like Olympiad contest or you just practice on your own? Uh, so I did a lot of programs. Uh, so for math specifically, I, well, I started doing math count back in middle school and then wow. I studied for all the different uh, math Olympiad competitions. Uh, so the ANC up to the uh IMO, although I never actually made it to the IMO, but I attended mock a few times. Uh, and I, through the art of problem solving, I took a few root classes that just helped me hone my mathematical thinking, my mathematical skill set, and how to approach problems in a very regimented manner and apply what I knew uh, and write it up in a proof based manner. So I kind of had that background from that study. But otherwise, most of my study was self directed, uh, where I would my mom helped a lot finding resources and I'd go and oh, devour right. the books and do a lot of problems on my own and try to then look at the solution to figure out where did I go wrong? What do I need to study more? And then go dig into that further and trying to perfect my understanding. Wow. wow. Sounds like you're a good learner. <laughs> and you also have a very supportive mom as well. I'm so happy for you, Eric. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. My family was very supportive. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, let's talk about more specific in your learning journey for the iPhone. Like 10 grade, you study like physics, but before that, like when did you start like learning calculus? Like, is it during ninth grade or before that? So I always was advanced. I actually studied calculus back in middle school. Um, wow. actually a little bit back, well, back in starting fifth grade, I guess. What the hell? But I wow. took AP calculus in, in seventh or eighth grade. Um, oh, and then wow. from there, I... Was, uh, did multivariable in ninth or tenth grade, whenever the class was available. So my math was always kind of like what kind of started me in trying to understand everything, and then everything followed from there. But then I'm like, oh well, everything is just applied math. And so then I was physics is just kind of the world, and that's kind of cool because then that's how everything works. Wow. Oh yeah, that's that's crazy. And may I ask that like, you know, you said like during seven eighth grade you took like. AB calculus is it like both A, B, and B C at the same time? Uh yes, I took both. Wow, that's oh. amazing. So basically nine doing nine grade, you start like multivariable calculus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in middle school I more or less had a self study self study curriculum where I would oh. kind of more or less teach myself and then the I because I was lucky to be part of a private school where they had a high school also. And so I, I couldn't get together to work with high school, but I was able to work with a teacher in the high school to help me learn at a more advanced grade. Wow, that's that's totally amazing. And so after you have the strong, you know, calculus background, you you can study like calculus based physics at that time. And maybe we know like what book that you use to self study for for the physics during tenth grade. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, there were a lot of books that I think are foundational. Uh, I really got started with Feynman's lectures uh, because they serve mm-hmm. as a great background. There was also Holiday um, as just the general base. But then once I got more into things, there were a lot of books that I read on more specific topics in order to better understand them. So I remember uh, Griffiths for Electromagnetism. Whoa. or And then there was, when I was doing quantum mechanics, I was going through like three or four different books just trying to understand the basics because it, I couldn't really intuitively understand it just by reading one book. So I find that, getting lots of different sources and seeing how different people approach it and kind of building my own understanding and my own mental imagery is really how I can look more deeply into things. I, I wish I had the time to read everything cover to cover, but I, I think that's not 
I would generally skim and then go more in depth in the parts where I either didn't understand something or I wanted to understand. Just mm. There's not enough time to go through that many books cover to cover. Um, yeah. I tried getting through the first volume of Find Me was excellent. Um, I The second one was pretty good, but then I didn't have as much time to go through the later edition. Uh, and then mm. for all the other things, of books where like electromagnetism or special delivery, I didn't really need to go that much in depth. I just needed to get enough to make sure I had a firm understanding of what was going on. Wow, but that's still amazing because not so many, you know, high school, I mean, beside the people who practice for the USA4 or I4, I mean, they, they're willing to read like, you know, those advanced stuff, but regular high school students, I mean, when they, you know, read like classical <laughs> mechanic, electrodynamic books, like, yeah, like, oh, no, 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 that's too so scary for me. But <laughs> to hear, you know, at that time you read so many things and also you joining math as well. So beside calculus, do you study like more advanced math during that time? Or are you waiting until like university to study more? As far as officially goes, I took a, a online Stanford class on a linear algebra and algebra senior year. But unofficially, I was studying a lot on my own before that point because in order to do well in math competitions, you have to understand more advanced trigonometry and geometry and yeah. combinatorics. And even if it's not like technically college mathematics, just going very deeply in the high school level was something that I was constantly doing. And so naturally, I would come up on more advanced concepts like uh, foundational algebra and Fourier analysis, um, because that's pretty important for physics as well. Um, And all these kind of one-on-one math courses at college. You mean like from high school already, you kind of like have the knowledge of the third year university student in physics and math, I would say. Yeah, second year, but yeah, um, I think oh, I, that's too cool. <laughs> I'm sure I had lots of gaps in my knowledge as well. So I wouldn't really say I was on that level, but I knew a lot of knowledge at that point that I think helped give me a better, broader understanding. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So like, aside from studying, what were your extracurricular like? Or if you had a like any like side physics projects that you were kind of doing when you were young, like in conjunction with studying, if you had any? So I had lots of extracurricular activities in addition to this. So like I was on my varsity uh, tennis team during oh. high school. So there was the TSA, I remember, where I helped make video games with as part of a team uh, to mm-hmm. try to compete their uh, technology student situation. Um, I was part of the, I helped find, found the computer science club where we, uh, Axel, uh, so we actually made a team and then drove out there and computed, competed in computer science. But as far as oh, wow. physics goes, uh, senior year, I actually was lucky enough to do a internship with a local physics group on quantum information theory. Uh, oh. where, so that was a pretty fun experience uh, where I got to dig more into quantum mechanics and try to understand quantum computing in a better manner. Yeah. <laughs> That's so wow. cool. Yeah, yeah. Sound, very, sound like a busy yeah. kid. Yeah. Mm. Busy kid. Yes, it was a very busy oh. high school. <laughs> busy life, bro. Eric, like, you know, knowing that the process of the iPhone is very long because you see, like, you you have, like, very intensive, like, training camp. You know, I, I, I interviewed a previous contestant, right? They told me, oh, my God, so many exams. You're doing a lot of stuff there. So can you share, like, how did you motivate yourself during that time? As well, like, you also participate in so many math competitions too, right? So they're going to be sometimes you mm-hmm. have to be feel like discouraged. So how can you cheer yourself up or motivate yourself? I always motivated myself because I was always motivated to learn more and understand more. So like I was, even though the competition was kind of like the long-term goal on kind of what sparked me to go into things, my short-term goal on a day-to-day basis was I was always enthusiastic about learning. I wanted to understand how this fits into what I currently know. How do I improve myself more? And so that's kind of what kept me motivated on a day to day level going up to competition. So I wanted to understand the problem better. If you like gave me a math problem, I would work on it, even if like there was no external reason to. Because I just wanted to understand how that problem works and how can I solve it. Um, I like challenges. And so that kept yeah. me motivated through my entire school experience. During like the actual competition itself, I remember when I was at camp when we were doing the tests day over day, where and it's not exactly clear uh, how we're going, to, how they're going to choose the team. Then it can be a little nerve wracking, especially right after you finish testing. You're not sure if you did everything right or you're running out of time, but you just have to work your way through it and do your best in the moment. And then afterwards, take a moment to relax. I mean, my parents were always there for me. Uh, mm-hmm. Neither of them are in 
science or professors or anything. Uh, so they didn't really know exactly, they couldn't help me in the subject matter itself, but they could always try to help me find resources or always provide motivation. Upon your first uh, IFO in 2012, how did you, like, what, what kind of feelings were running through your head when, uh, you know, when you were able to participate, like, in that moment? Uh, yeah, so I remember it was in Estonia, and we flew out a few days early to Finland to just get acclimated in so that we weren't jet lagged during the comp system itself. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. I was hanging out with the other members of the team while I was there. And we remember did a lot of sightseeing while also kind of doing problems in our head just to keep ourselves sharp. Um, but it's not yeah. really, there's not much you can do at the last second. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're and right. then at the competition itself, the competition is actually, a, it was a week long uh, mm. extravaganza. So for the first few days, you're just hanging out with the other participants on your own team and internationally, just to, waiting for all the judges to go through the problems, finalize them, translate them into their own countries, uh, languages, and then you have the actual competition midweek. And so during those days, you're kind of just waiting, wondering, all right, when is the actual competition going to happen? You need some people I'm competing with. And it's uh, pretty nervous, but you just kind of try to focus on whatever events they're throwing at the moment. Because Estonia, mm. uh, Estonia was doing lots of things to kind of keep us entertained during that time. Uh, so they threw like a folk festival and they were oh, wow. doing this different thing. And there was an optical course, although that was after the competition, actually. But I mean, the, it was a rainy a bit during while I was there, so that could have no. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. it was a very it was a great experience. Yeah. Do you do you remember how you felt when you uh, won your first gold medal? Can you take me through that moment? Yes. So, going into the final award ceremony, they didn't actually tell us how we did, but we did have to sit in our seat. So they gave everybody tickets with their seating assignments, and I could see looking at the seating assignments, I was towards the front of the uh, seating area. All the other people were a little bit front down. So yeah. once I, everybody got up and they sat down, I was in the front row. So I was pretty excited because I thought like, oh, this might be that I did very, very well. Um, so I was pretty enthusiastic just going into things like, wow, I yeah. can't believe I'm this. Um, and so then when they started the ceremony and they were going through everything, I was very excited. And they started announcing where the bronze and silver and gold numbers were. And so I was like, yes, I got gold. I did, did well. And so I was enthusiastic at that point. And then I remember at one point uh, where they started giving out special prizes for various things. And there was one student who we had a hard time understanding exactly what he was trying to do. And I know I have horrible handwriting. I was writing down because there's not that much content. So I was literally just writing like chicken scratch just to try to get my ideas on the paper. Yeah. So as soon as he said we, had, we couldn't understand what the hell he was writing, I knew he was talking about me. So I was like, yes, hey. <laughs> So then he wrote on and he's like, and I had to take the best a prize for the best solution on the theoretical example, where I had a particularly clever solution for one of the problems wow. in that theoretical portion. And so I ended up uh, going to the stage and getting a camera. So that was pretty oh, powerful. Nice. That's awesome, man. So you kind of like got a gold medal and also like some sort of like certificate for the special prize as well. Wow, so like double at the same time. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. I got a yeah, I got a gold medal and then they gave they gave different prizes for all of the different things. So all the gold medalists, we got a spoon that was um I forget what the term for it is. But if you put it in hot water, the spoon bends. So you can make the spoon look like it disappears if you drop it in a cup of hot water. Uh and there was um memory medal or something like that. And the mm. different People got all things. And they gave us lots of little gizmos and gadgets and things all throughout the camp experience. Um, but then I remember um, when I was finally on the airplane going home, my coaches gave me a pamphlet of paper that the judges apparently handed them, where at the top of a uh, please fill out the sheet for the benefit of all your future professors and students. It had A, B, C, D all through the left side, and they wanted me to repeat practicing my letters for my handwriting. How about like uh, Vietnamese food? Do you have any Vietnamese food like in your mind? If you haven't tried any? Oh, uh, I really like banh mi. And oh, pho. yes. Oh, banh mi. Oh, man. That's What's a classic that? one. Oh, yes. Classic, thank you. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope like uh, the, the Vietnamese audience who watched this is going to be like, yay, Eric like the banh mi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Eric, for oh, sharing that. Yeah, thank you. So 
out of all the Olympia contests that you've uh, you've participated in, which one did you like the most, or that was the most interesting? So each of them had their own flavors to it. I mean, physics I think was the best because I was actually able to go internationally and actually get to meet lots of different people. While most of the other ones were more at a national level, where I was able to go to the camps for many of them, but uh, not go to the international level. So in that respect, physics is the best. But each of them is very different as far as the competition itself goes. So some of them are more on the memorization heavy side of things like biology. Uh, some of them have more physical application where you actually have to do more of the practical component. Like chemistry was very practical based. Um, computer science was a mixture of both where you have to in, be very hands-on with it. But it's also there's a very strong theory component. Uh, linguistics, there's a decent mental uh, theory component but a lot of it is just being able to apply problem solving skills in practice. Uh, math was pretty much all being able to be clever, but also there's a lot of tricks and techniques that you need to know in advance. So each thing had its own flavors and its own approaches that you had to have in order to do well. In the, uh, and each required its own training and research to try to understand the field of study. Well, so I think that wasn't, just that I study different things, but also they support each other. Being able to do well in math helped me do well in physics. And mm -hmm. being able to do well in physics helped me do well in chemistry. And that helped me do well in biology. So I think that it wasn't just the one thing. It's, I was able to better understand all of it by studying yeah. one of them. Out of those competitions, you know, ABMO, math counts, HMMT, ARML, like so many things. Like which mm -hmm. one was your most favorite math competition? I mean, they all were great for different reasons. Uh, so like all of the individual ones, like the AMC ones were great because I was able to go to MOP and I was able to meet lots and lots of smart, cool people. Uh, some of the better vocal ones were ARMO, uh, the American Regions Math League, because I was actually on a team of, there was like 60 of us, uh, four different groupings of 15, where I was able to work with the same group of people year over year as we got better and improved. And actually my last three years of high school, we were the first place team. And so we were wow. pretty uh, Could you uh, maybe share your experience uh, during the MOP and maybe kind of comp compare and contrast it with the, the Maryland training plant that you did? Sure. So they were pretty similar in a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both fairly large scale camps. Uh, Maryland had a dozen or two people. MOP had around 50 or so people. Um, and it was in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, mm. Both in the middle of nowhere, more or less. Uh, and they both had a lot of similar parts to it where there were fun activities, but there was also classes each day where you're trying to improve your actual understanding of math or physics or whatever. Um, and yeah. then interspersed with conditions themselves. Uh, where they're trying to, one, you do the test and you can see how well you're, what you learn from the classes, you can then apply and practice and take all of your knowledge and try to apply it. But also yeah. where then they would take those scores and then use them to figure out who to put on the actual team. Both of them were great, but then also a little bit stressful at times. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you always want to do well on the team, uh, yeah. do your best and try to make them on the team. Uh, the other people were... Great. Um, it's interesting because a lot of the camps had this, you'd see the same people over and over again. I remember there were some oh. people who were at the camp who were also at the math. Yeah. Camp. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, hey, how are you doing? I um, remember you. Yeah. Oh. And I know it's him again in college when I do college competitions or okay. so. It's, it, yeah. it's a pretty small community. But otherwise, yeah, they're both very intense experiences with lots of great people and great teachers. One thing that oh, was different you. about them, but mm -hmm. the physics. Uh, was more hands-on. So they would have experimental demonstrations. So I remember oh, one wow. time they came in with like liquid nitrogen and demonstrated the lean and cross effect where he was able to pour it in his hand without burning himself. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, there's not as much physical stuff in math and there's no, you can't like do a pendulum and see like, oh, that's how the math works. No, but in physics, you can do that kind of thing as part of the experimental aspect of it. So there's some differences, but generally, you know, you see the same kids, you know, structure is kind of the same i see oh very cool so um you're a math major at princeton what made you kind of um like pick math because i know you have a lot of different interests you competed a lot 
Sure. So I was pretty conflicted when I first came in, whether I wanted mm-hmm. to do computer science or math or physics. And yeah. what I think it ended up coming down to was that math was just the most general. So I was able to take math courses while also focusing it on whatever classes were more interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, good reason. So I, I did I did end up getting certificates that Princeton worked for minors in computer science and finance. Uh, because and I also took uh oh, advanced finance. Courses. Yeah, so currently I'm a work in finance as a trader. Uh, but during college, I was able to explore lots of different things. So like freshman year, I remember I was able to take a What Makes for a Meaningful Life freshman seminar and another one for uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So I was able to kind of explore random things uh, in addition mm-hmm. to focusing more on my math and computer science coursework. So I remember I took a course in algebra number theory is for advanced math and Going back to computer science, I was able to take algorithms and uh, more specific applications. Uh, yeah. And then in finance, I was able to take like the cap to calculus, or, which is more just most just advanced math. So I was able to do things all over the spectrum. Wow! So basically, like math major, but you took like CS and physics course at the same time. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> A very broad, broadened education. Yeah. During your first and second year, like, did you take any like graduate level course? Oh yes. Um. So the Two of the courses, the algebraic number theory, the stochastic calculus, I mentioned, were technically graduate level courses. You know, for student who interested in you know applying to Princeton, like I can share, like just quickly about you, like the culture there, and what's your most favorite and least favorite thing about Princeton? Sure. So I, I really enjoyed my Princeton experience. There was lots of really smart people uh, from all over the world, uh, and it was just great getting to meet the other students, getting to know them better. Uh, being part of different uh, environments with them. So I was part of an eating club and I got to know people on a very, uh, and especially like my roommates. Uh, senior year, I had three other roommates and we got to know each other pretty well and I'm still friends with them, um, pretty close communication. So I think that the connections I formed were pretty, was one of the strongest things about the Princeton experience. Oh yeah, and it's also like close to your home as well, right? That's also the reason that you picked Princeton. <laughs> It's one of many reasons, yes. It was between MIT, Harvard, and Princeton. And, and it, Princeton was my final choice because it had a very strong undergraduate focus. Princeton was pretty much devoted to their undergraduate body. And it was close to me. And it had a very well-rounded uh, course and structure and student body. And I thought that was important for me uh, to try to get that kind of diverse experience. Because I don't think I would have yeah. been able to take each and each and each and each just any time. <laughs> You mentioned uh, like earlier, you participated in like competitions during uh, college as well. Um, how did they like compare to the competitions you did when you were younger? And you know, what was your experience at these competitions? Sure. So they were pretty similar in a lot of respects. So mm-hmm. I, my biggest ones that I participated in college were the Putnam exam and ICPC, or the International Computer Program Competition. The Putnam exam was great as a math specific competition. Uh, and actually help teach a seminar at Princeton once a week where people would come and we'd work on problems together and try to learn how to better approach that competition. Uh, and I did very well uh, wow. one year getting the net money. And so that was pretty cool. But that's fairly similar to the high school competitions where you're trying, you have a very limited amount of time. You're just trying to write two scores or instead of problems. And it really comes down to how well do you understand these concepts Although then they also apply college concepts like calculus and group theory and algebra, which aren't normally found in high school level. So a little mm-hmm. different, mostly the same. Um, but overall, good competition. ICPC, on the other hand, was interesting. I because it's a team competition, which I didn't normally find through my high school experience. So mm-hmm. I was on a team with two other people, um, and we would work uh, meet up before the competition once every week or so. Um, to try to get a sense of what each other's strengths and weaknesses are and how do we practice and get fast the right typing and coding. Um, it's a coding competition. And so being oh, some of us okay. worked on trying to solve the problems um, because they were more math-based. So like one uh, one of the members was a fellow math major and another one was a uh, computer science major. Uh, yeah. And then I had math and computer science. And so generally, uh, you'd all be trying to solve the problems. The math major would be working more on the theoretical side, trying to figure out how to solve oh, it. Oh. Um, there's a limited amount of computer safety. The others would be trying to type up the problems that we actually solved to try to get it out as fast as possible. And so it was a pretty unique kind of team experience trying to get everything. Yeah. 
And so that was a pretty cool competition. And I actually made the international level with that twice. Uh, once I went with one team to Morocco. Uh, so that was a fun experience. Uh, and then another time I made it the following year to South Dakota. Wow. Um, it's so cool to see that, you know, your competitive, like, you know, like spirit is still carry on during like Princeton by putting them, like you got a like, top 20. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. Besides competition, uh, do you do any project in general, like related to CS and math or maybe physics? Well, sure. I did a handful of projects. I did it, it was involved in a handful of hackathons, which I always found yeah. for fun to try to get a project out quickly. Uh, and there was one course I remember where the entire course was more on applications. And so the, I, half the semester was working on a single project. I remember I made an app with the team uh, called Downtime, where it was supposed to be like a social uh, media style app for scheduling uh, around conflicts and trying to come up with good times to meet up with people on campus. We thought it was a pressing issue at the time. I mean, for your competitive like mindset, do you sleep at all during <laughs> those hackathons? Yeah, I, I would get a few hours sleep in, maybe like oh three or four God. hours sleep just because I wouldn't be able to focus right. if I didn't sleep at all. Bro. At the end of it, I, you can't even get your program to compile if you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing, Eric. Yes, thank you. We, we, we found that you worked as a, or you interned at Google as a software engineer. And uh, we're just wondering what kind of experiences you had there. Oh, sure. So I interned at, uh, during... My college experience, I was kind of debating where I wanted, what I want to do afterwards. And so mm-hmm. for me personally, I was always between academia, Silicon Valley, and finance. And so I tried doing research. I tried going to Silicon Valley and interning at Facebook and Google. And then I tried doing finance. And so I found that for me personally, I enjoyed finance more. But the, my experience at Google and Facebook was great. Um, so Google was pretty cool. It was in California. I was interning at Mountain View. And there were other people from my college there and also for people who I knew from different um, Olympiads that I was aware of. Uh, and so I remember while I was there, I was able to kind of get a better sense. I was working on research in natural language processing while I was there, which was pretty cool because it was something I hadn't had much experience with prior previously uh, on Google's knowledge team. And so that was pretty neat. And I was able to meet a lot of people. Their, their perks are pretty amazing. Uh, and also just being in Silicon Valley at the time, I was able, there was a lot of companies who were trying to attract a lot of talent. So I was able to go and visit a lot of companies because they had a lot of open houses. So that was pretty cool getting to explore the entire area. Wow. Oh, nice. Oh, and Eric, well, where did you gonna see yourself in the next five years? It's just a theoretical you know, view about the future. Well, first, I need to get through this year with COVID and everything. Yes. But mm-hmm. as far as five years from now, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I'm at with trading. Uh, so we'll see where the future takes me. Good answer. This is going to be the last question for the audience, like for the student who want to participate in IFO in the future. Do you have any word of encouragement to tell them during like, their learning process? Um, sure. I mean, I think it's a lot of work. You, you have to really put your heart and soul into it. Um, and I don't think you should just be doing it just to try to for the specific IFO end goal. Um, I think that you have to really do it because you love it, because you're really interested in the material at the time. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep that enthusiasm up and be able to actually absorb the material. One thing is that it's really hard for somebody to teach you something. You have to learn it yourself. You have to, it has to be self-motivated. So good luck. There's so many famous scientists, but they never want a gold medal. So it doesn't matter like mm-hmm. what medal you got. Right. It's just a fun experience in general. Yeah, like oh, yes. I thought we're all these kind of more like a sprint. Well, I think research and all that is really more of a marathon. And so it's a very different style. I think if you want to go into physics or anything as a professional, I think all it takes is hard work um, and mm-hmm. over a long period of time. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Eric. Your story is very incredible. Like you also have a special love for math in your heart, right? There's also CS as well like programming, math, and physics. Oh my goodness. We, we are so honored to talk to you right now. I would yeah. never for, forget this, you know, this interview. You're so like productive. And on behalf of the like, uh, Vietnamese physics community, like I and, you know, Ryan, thank you so much for your participation in this interview. And I hope like your story will inspire so many students, you know, to learn anything you can, right? explore more the world, like need you guys to, you know, 
to spend more time on multiple topics. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you. This was a, a lot of fun. Yes, thank you, Eric. Nice yeah. to meet you. Nice Thanks, to see Eric. You. All right, see you, Eric. <laughs> Quay trở lại với mình. Wow, anh Eric thật sự là một quái vật và mình cảm thấy rất là choáng luôn. Trước khi phân tích buổi phỏng vấn, chúng ta hãy cùng nhau điểm lại lộ trình học vật lý của anh nhé. Eric bắt đầu học giải tích từ năm lớp 5. Thú thật với các bạn là vào năm lớp 5, mình học toán rất là dở và thi có 7 điểm trong kỳ thi chuyển cấp. Nhưng cơ mà cái ông này, ổng nhảy thẳng lên giải tích luôn. Wait what? Sau đó đến tận năm lớp 9, anh mới bắt đầu học giải tích 3 được dạy bởi ngôi trường phổ thông của mình. Tới năm lớp 10, anh bắt đầu học vật lý và sử dụng những cuốn sách sau đây The Feynman Lecture on Physics hay là những bài giảng của Feynman Cơ sở vật lý của Halliday, Resnick and Crane Cơ học cổ điển của David Morin và Điện Động lực học của David Griff Đây thật sự là những quyển sách rất là đáng sợ dành cho các bạn học sinh lớp 10 thông thường Sau đó, anh dành cả năm lớp 11 để ôn luyện, giải các đề thi iPhone và giành được huy chương vàng ở trong năm đó Tới năm lớp 12 anh tự học thêm toán cao cấp như là đại số tuyến tính hay linear algebra từ một lớp online miễn phí của trường đại học danh giá Stanford cũng như đọc thêm các quyển sách nâng cao về cơ học lượng tử như là nhập môn cơ học lượng tử của David Griff và The Principle of Quantum Mechanics của Paul Dirac. Chưa hết, anh cũng tham gia một khóa thực tập tại một công ty làm về máy tính lượng tử và đây cũng là một cơ hội tốt để Eric có thể áp dụng những kiến thức vật lý của mình vào với thực tế bởi vì anh đã từng tham dự mob đến 3 lần cho nên chúng ta cũng chưa tính đến việc anh học rất nhiều kiến thức toán nâng cao dành cho các bạn thi học sinh giỏi toán quốc gia cũng như IMO xuyên suốt năm cấp 3. Ok, giờ mình sẽ nói về phần cảm nhận của mình. Đầu tiên, mình rất rất là khâm phục niềm đam mê học thuật cháy bỏng của anh Eric. Lý do anh tham gia nhiều kỳ thi khoa học như thế là vì anh muốn đắm mình trong kiến thức khoa học cũng như nâng cao khả năng giải quyết vấn đề của mình. Trong buổi phỏng vấn, anh nhắc đến cụm từ trau dồi kiến thức rất là nhiều lần. Điều đó cho chúng ta thấy, thế giới này sẽ có người đam mê quyền lực, người đam mê danh vọng, chứ anh Eric thì chỉ đam mê kiến thức mà thôi. Tiếp đó, mình cũng rất là nể khả năng tự học của anh khi mà anh đã tự học giải tích từ năm lớp 5, một độ tuổi phải nói rất là nhỏ để có thể tiếp thu các kiến thức cao cấp này. Còn về việc đọc những quyển sách vật lý khó, anh không có đọc hết chúng, nhưng biết cách chọn lọc và nghiên cứu những phần nội dung quan trọng để có thể phục vụ cho kỳ thi IFO. Do đó, đọc sách một cách thông minh cũng là một kỹ năng rất bổ ích mà chúng ta cần học hỏi. Nó rất là quan trọng nếu sau này các bạn có các công việc liên quan đến khoa học và công nghệ. Cuối cùng, mình rất là thích tính cách cởi mở của anh khi anh chia sẻ niềm vui học tập, niềm vui khi đi Estonia một cách hồn nhiên và nhiệt huyết. Anh là một con người rất là hòa đồng luôn. Bây giờ, mình muốn cung cấp cho các bạn một thông tin rất là đặc biệt. Sau tập 5 lần này, chúng ta sẽ có những buổi phỏng vấn khác đến từ các vị huấn luyện viên của tuyển iPhone Mỹ. Khi đó, mình chắc chắn rằng các bạn sẽ được nghe những câu chuyện cũng như những chia sẻ học tập cực kỳ bổ ích và thú vị. Vì vậy, mọi người hãy nhớ đón xem nhé! Tới đây, mình muốn gửi một thông điệp để có thể tri ân một cố thành viên của team vật lý chiêu, đó chính là anh Ryan Đặng, người đã cùng mình tham gia trong buổi phỏng vấn lần này. Anh mất vào ngày 4 tháng 10 năm 2021 và hưởng dương 22 tuổi. Đây thật sự là một thông tin cực kỳ sốc đối với cả team Đặc biệt là với bản thân mình, khi mình trực tiếp cùng anh Ryan phỏng vấn Eric. Ryan đã giúp mình soạn các câu hỏi để phỏng vấn Eric, cũng như cải thiện kỹ năng giao tiếp một cách tự tin hơn. Mình thật sự không ngờ là bọn mình chỉ mới gặp vào tháng 1 năm nay mà thôi khi hai đứa cùng nhau trò chuyện rất là vui vẻ. Và giờ đây, bọn mình không thể nào gặp lại nhau một lần nữa. Mình còn nhớ rất là rõ khi được mình mời tham dự thực hiện series này, anh Ryan đã cực kỳ nhiệt huyết và còn bảo với mình rằng anh sẽ làm hết sức để có thể đóng góp một phần nho nhỏ vào sự phát triển của nền giáo dục Việt Nam cũng như sẽ cố gắng chia sẻ những kiến thức mới lạ cho các bạn học sinh đến từ đất nước cội nguồn của mình. Ngoài ra, anh cũng thực hiện nhiều hoạt động từ thiện giúp đỡ các trẻ em nghèo, khuyết tật ở Việt Nam thông qua một tổ chức phi lợi nhuận mang tên SAB Việt Nam. Ryan thật sự là một người anh mà mình rất là khâm phục, một nhà lãnh đạo trẻ, một nguồn cảm hứng mà cả team sẽ luôn noi theo. Vì vậy, thay mặt cho cả kênh vật lý chiêu, mình xin cảm ơn sự giúp đỡ và đóng góp chân thành của anh. Well, thank you so much Ryan. You are our leader, our source of inspiration. Please, rest in peace my man. You are gone, but not forgotten. And we definitely gonna carry your, your legacy 
for the future generations. And we believe that you will be in a better place. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much.